Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Book of Revelation. It's been several weeks since I've been with you. Gabe has done a fantastic job taking the last several sessions, and so I'm going to jump back in here into Revelation chapter 20. Uh, Gabe took one session to discuss the millennium, and this is an incredibly important uh, topic, so I thought it would be good just to take a few more sessions to sort of zero in, uh, borrow down in on this issue of the millennium. And in this particular session, the title of which is The Millennium and Church History, sounds kind of boring, sounds kind of dry, but sometimes it's good. You know, like in some of these sessions, we're going to discuss some of the real visceral and emotional and practical applicational realities to some of the things that we're discussing. Other times, such as in this session, it's going to be a little bit more of a class. We're going to discuss some of the foundational different ideas concerning the end times, amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennialism, some of these terms that often confuse people who are just beginning to learn about these things and really just lay some basic groundwork. So this is kind of, a, you could say it's an introductory uh, lesson to some of the primary eschatological views. And obviously we're not covering all of the different subsets of different views and different ways to view things, but we are going to discuss the primary different perspectives concerning the millennium. And specifically what I want to do is actually survey the primary perspective on these things throughout church history. I personally always find surveying church history very, very helpful in my formation and decision in terms of what I believe and why I believe it. I find it very helpful to understand ideas, not only to understand the ideas, but to understand the history and the development of those ideas, where they came from, and why different ideas are super popular today. And to be quite frank, this is, um, it's an opportunity, it's a good time to do this because presently within the church, there is a huge debate. There's a huge conflict um, among those that are more on the reformed uh, side of things and those that are more on the, I'll say, the uh, dispensationalist perspective. And you've got a lot of people that are really gravitating toward what is called post-millennialism. So we're going to discuss post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, amillennialism, and uh, hopefully help people to understand these things a little bit better. So as always, um, we're going to go ahead and just start with the relevant text, and then we'll sort of tease it out a bit. So Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the keys of the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, or Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. So here's the first reference to the thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years are completed. There's the second reference to the millennium. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and they who sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And they had refused, they had not worshipped the beast in his image. They had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ for how long? A thousand years. There's the third reference. The rest of the dead, however, did not come to life until the thousand years were complete. There's the fourth reference. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. They will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign for him. They will reign with him for a thousand years. So again, we've got in six verses, we have five references to a thousand years. Now, as different theologians, students of the scriptures have come to these over the years, some have said, no, there is a literal thousand years that is yet to come. We should understand this literally. And then others, of course, because it's the book of Revelation, they've said, no, this should be understood in a um, more of a, a general way. It doesn't actually have to be a thousand years specifically. And then others just say, I, there's, there's really no such thing as an actual thousand year period. It's allegorical. It's spiritual. We're in it now. Okay. So we're going to discuss these different um, perspectives. But before we do, we need to understand the primary two competing worldviews 
that were dominating the Middle East in the first century, during the time of the New Testament, during that period, both a few hundred years before and leading up to the book of Revelation being written, what were the two primary worldviews that were competing for the hearts and minds of people throughout the Middle East? And those two worldviews are the biblical or the Hebraic worldview. Okay, we're going to discuss that, what that is. And the other worldview was the pagan or the Greek philosophical worldview. Now, we're not going to get into this in great detail, but it's always important for people to understand these two competing perspectives, to understand the ways in which they overlap and the ways in which they fundamentally disagree, and to understand how these ideas um, affected the way that people interpret passages like this in the book of Revelation. So we're going to start out with Genesis 1, uh, verse 1 and verse 12. Okay, so the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. And then in verse 12, God looks at it and he says, it was good. God saw that it was good. And at the end of each day, after he creates mankind, after he creates animals, plants, and these things, he looks at it each time and he says, he saw that it was good. So when God created the heavens, plural, and the earth, he said, it's good. Now, just to the, uh, the right of the verse here, I've got a basic diagram of the universe. Okay, the circle represents the totality of everything that exists. Nothing exists outside of creation. In fact, even God himself said that he stretched out the heavens like a tent and then he dwells within the heavens at the height of the highest heavens. God himself actually has chosen to live within the, the universe that he created. So the circle represents the totality of all that exists. And again, the Bible describes the earth. And then above the earth, you have the sky, you have sort of space, and then you have the place where God dwells. You've got the various levels of heaven or the heavens, um, if you will. And again, we don't fully understand all of these things. To be very clear, we don't understand how angels show up and eat food and wrestle with people and then disappear. We don't understand the physics of all of it. We don't understand, is heaven like another dimension? You know, could Einstein have sort of explained it? Can quantum physics explain it? Or is it just something completely different? Now, this is the biblical worldview. The Greek or Platonic, okay, that's based on the name Plato, the Greek philosophical worldview it's similar to the Hebraic or biblical worldview, but it's also quite different. The Greek philosophical worldview essentially holds that the earth is the physical realm, okay? We're down here, the realm of materiality. We can, there's physicality to everything. The heavens, or heaven, uh, if you will, that's the spiritual realm. That's the realm of immateriality. It's the realm of spirits or ghosts, uh, if you wanna use that term. And it's spiritual, you know, beings, you can put your hand right through them, right? Here on the earth, there's physicality to these things. So the physical realm and the immaterial realm, or the material realm and the immaterial realm, those are juxtaposed. Now, the Greek philosophical worldview holds essentially that the physical realm is bad, it's corrupt, it's lower, and the, the spiritual realm is pure. And so the goal, if you will, of spirituality. The goal of the Greek philosophical worldview is to escape the physical realm. It's to escape this world. It's to escape the shell of the body and to become spirit forever, to become this uh, immaterial spirit. And, and there's still an existence. There's still some type of a spiritual body, if you will, but it's just not material. And you're from that place ever sort of working up to these different uh, spheres within the immaterial realm and sort of attaining higher planes and this type of thing. Okay, so you can see here, you go, well, wow, as modern Christians, we believe the Bible, but our worldview, or at least many Christians' worldview, is actually far more platonic. We think of the physical realm down here as physical, and then we think of heaven as immaterial, where spirits and ghosts dwell. Biblically speaking, the Bible teaches that the earth is both material and spiritual. The Bible also teaches that the heavens are both material and spiritual. Okay, the heavens, in heaven, there's a throne, there's furniture, there's noises. It's not just a place where ghosts live. God is not just a ghost. God actually has some type of a body. 
You know, we don't understand. But the Bible says, you know, he has feet and hair and hands and, you know, all of these things. And Jesus, of course, himself actually took on flesh. But we need to remember, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And they were all good. So the Bible doesn't teach that the earth is bad and the heavens are good. The Bible teaches that the earth is good. It was good, but it's been corrupted. It's presently experiencing the effects of the fall as well as other spiritual rebellions and the heavens itself. Heaven itself is also corrupt. There are uh, rebellious principalities that are in the heavenly realm and they are actually controlling parts of the world and countries and different things like that. And so all things both in heaven and on earth are not the way they should be. But when all is said and done, he's going to redeem He's going to heal. He's going to restore and in many ways bring heaven and earth together. Okay, and we will have, and this is important, we will have resurrected, physical resurrected, immortal glorified bodies. We're not just going to become ghosts forever. We will get to taste and smell and see and hear things in our eternal glorified immortal bodies. Okay, so we need to understand that physicality or the earth from a biblical perspective is good and things are moving toward redemption, which is basically this. What is the gospel? What is the good news? What is the hope that the Bible uh, promises? What is redemption? It's essentially, Jesus uses this term, he calls it the regeneration. Peter refers to it as the time for the restoration of all things, of which all of the prophets have spoken. And to summarize, what does the restoration of all things mean? What is that? It's basically this. It's the restoration of Eden. It's the restoration of the way things were at the beginning. It's the renewal of Eden. You know, the Bible ends at the book of Revelation, and we'll get there, where you've got so many of the elements of Eden there in the New Jerusalem. You've got the, the tree of life and the leaves for the healing of the nations, and it bears fruit and 12 different kinds of fruit and all of these things. So you've got the restoration of Eden, and really, biblically speaking, you could say it's combined with the restoration of the kingdom of David. And it's something way better. It's an amplified Eden. It's a new and improved Eden. It's certainly a new and improved kingdom of David. You combine those two things together, and that is essentially the new heavens and the new earth that the Bible promises. Okay, so a little bit of basic introduction to biblical worldview to understand the difference between the Greek Platonic worldview and the biblical worldview. And you can see, as I said, you can see where modern Christianity, in many ways, it's kind of a hybrid. Um, very early on, we embraced, we adopted a lot of this Greek paganism. And so many Christians today believe that we're down here on the earth. The earth is, it's good, it's beautiful, but it's also corrupt. And someday we escape and we become ghosts forever in heaven. We go to heaven forever and we sing and, and this type of thing. But the concept of resurrection, they'll go, well, yeah, I guess the Bible does teach resurrection, but you know, like we have bodies. Like it's actually, for some people, that's actually a, um, a novel or new idea. Uh, modern Christianity, in many ways, it is sort of a mixture between biblical uh, doctrine and Greek philosophical worldview. So that's important to note. We always want to get away from uh, false ideas and lies and embrace the worldview that the Bible teaches us. Okay, so how do we understand the millennium? How do we understand the future? How do we understand these things? We're going to start out with something very basic. This is what's called Jewish apocalyptic. So this is how the Bible um, frames and helps us to understand the way things are and where they are going. So I've got a timeline here. We are currently in this age. This age is the age that's defined after the fall, after the collapse, after the fall of Eden, if you will, we've entered this age. We are in this age right now. That's where we are. And the day is coming, according to the Bible, where something will happen called the day of the Lord. It's a radical transition from this age into the age to come. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment, and he'll reward the righteous and the faithful and those who have put their trust in him, and he'll punish the wicked um, with vengeance and uh, the unrighteous with uh, chastisements, punishments, judgments, salvation, deliverance, rewards for the righteous, okay? So you've got this age and the age to come. The age to come, however, biblically speaking, as I said, it's envisioned as something like a, a combination between a restored Eden, a restored paradise, 
and a restored kingdom of David. Now, there's so many different passages we could look at, but just one passage in particular that's very important, Isaiah 66, verses 13 through 16. This is speaking of the coming of God and the day of the Lord. So he says, So I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. So for the believer, our comfort, our relief, our rest, our hope, that which we're looking forward to, is defined by something called Zion or Jerusalem. And he says, it's in this in this city, in this vision, in this age, in this time, that you will be comforted, you will see, you will rejoice, and you will flourish like the grass. You'll prosper, your heart will rejoice. And then he says, then, in that day, at that time, the Lord's power will be revealed to his servants. The word revealed in Hebrew is then translated into the Greek apocalypsis, the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord's power will be revealed to his servants. There it is. He will show wrath against his enemies. So salvation rewards deliverance for the righteous, vengeance, punishment, judgment for the wicked. And then it says this, look, the Lord will come. Come from where? from heaven. He will get up off of his throne and come down. It says, the Lord will come in fire. In the same way that he came down on Mount Sinai in fire, the Bible teaches that he's going to come down from heaven in fire. Again, to reward and save the righteous, to punishment and judge the wicked. It says, behold, the Lord will come in fire, his chariots, his merkava, like the whirlwind. I love this. His chariots, his Uh, his chariot throne like uh, like a tornado to execute his anger and his fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the Lord will execute judgment on all humanity with his fiery sword and many will be those slain by the Lord. So again, to go back to the, the chart, the day of the Lord, biblically speaking, is understood as the day when God once again will come down. As he came down on Mount Sinai, he's coming back to Mount Zion in fire. And it's the coming of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord, which are linked together. The coming of God and the day of the Lord are one and the same. And the day of the Lord, the coming of God, is that which separates this age from the age to come. Okay, the age to come is the age of redemption, the renewal of all things, the restoration of Eden. This age is the age of corruption. It's the age of sin. It's the age of death. It's the age of all of the things that make us sigh and groan. And therefore, we are waiting, we are looking forward to the day of the Lord and the establishment of his kingdom on the earth. Okay, so Jewish apocalyptic, that was the basic framework. Again, very, very basic. That was the dominant view of those that adhered to the Bible. If you were to talk to Jesus or the apostles or those that lived 100 years before him or those that lived 500 years before him, that was the framework whereby they viewed all of history. That's how they viewed the timeline, where history is moving toward. It's moving toward this cataclysmic, pivotal day of the Lord that separates this age from the age to come, from the age of redemption. Now to understand that age of redemption, by the way, is what the book of Revelation refers to as this thousand year period. You go, but I thought it's longer than a thousand years. Yes, it is. But biblically speaking, it teaches that the thousand years, it's essentially a transition into what we'll call the eternal state, the way things will be forever. The millennium is this transitionary Um, period. So to understand these things, Christians have come up with three different theological terms. We have premillennialism. What does premillennialism mean? It's very simple. It means that the day of the Lord is previous to the millennium. It means that the day of the Lord, the coming of God, which we Christians would say is the return of Jesus, that that happens previous to the millennium. Thus, pre-millennialism. Jesus returns, he establishes his throne, and then he rules and reigns on the earth for a thousand years, which transitions into the eternal state. Secondly, you have something called amillennialism or amillennialism. 
which simply means no millennium. There is no real literal millennium. It's spiritual. It's allegorical. We are in it now. So our amillennialist um, brethren, essentially what they teach or believe, what they hold to is that at the cross, Jesus essentially brought in the millennium. It's an invisible millennium. It's not real. It's not a literal thousand years. Obviously, it's been a couple thousand years since Jesus, but we're basically in the kingdom now. We're to experience all of the blessings spiritually now. That's uh, millennialism, or again, as our British friends say, a millennialism. And then you have something called post-millennialism. Post-millennialism is, it's really, to be quite fair, it's kind of a hybrid. It's kind of a mixture between the two. So post-millennialists essentially teach that the church started out in persecution, in weakness, it was a new movement, and gradually we've moved on from persecution to victory, and that the gospel itself should constantly be on the march. It should be advancing. It should be spreading throughout the earth. And while there's certainly many ebbs and flows, you know, you could kind of like the um, the chart if you were looking at the history of Bitcoin, you know, there's some ups and there's some downs and then there's victories and losses. The idea is that eventually the gospel will win. Eventually the church as the body or the sort of embodiment or representative of Christ on the earth, we will for all intents and purposes, establish this golden era, this utopia on the earth. And then at the end of that, Jesus will return and then will enter the eternal state. So post-millennialists believe that Jesus returns at the end of post, after the millennium. Okay, you go, that sounds very unique. Postmillennialism is an effort to sort of save our millennialism. It, it leans on some literalism and some very spiritual, metaphorical um, hermeneutic, uh, sort of how we interpret the Bible. Premillennialism, for what it's worth, generally takes much more of a literal or what's called a face value approach to interpreting scripture. Um, I like to use the term rational literalism, which is basically how all human language works. It means, of course, there's plenty of allegory and metaphor and symbolism and all these type of things used throughout the Bible, all sorts of expressions and idioms. But for the most part, it's usually speaking pretty straightforward. You know, um, if you read the Bible and study it enough, you know when it's speaking spiritually, metaphorically, symbolically, you know when it's historical narrative, you know when it's poetry, you know when it's prophecy, and you interpret each portion of scripture accordingly, okay? Amillennialism essentially leans very heavily on a spiritualized hermeneutic, which is to say that many, many things are metaphors or allegories or this type of thing. And I would argue that it does so in a way that if you did it in normal life, people would think that you were probably schizophrenic. And I know that that's a sort of strong language, but it's like this. Again, every form of literature is a specific type of literature, and there are certain rules in terms of how you interpret that type of literature. So if I'm listening to, and this really happened, I always use this as an example. Um, if I was listening to a late night talk show host, like David Letterman, remember David Letterman? And I'm listening to his monologue, you know, his sort of commentary and his jokes. If I listen to it as though it's a monologue, as though he's telling jokes, then I'm listening to it appropriately. If I listen to it, however, as though he is sending me secret messages, then I'm not only misinterpreting his words, I'm probably schizophrenic. And this is what schizophrenics often do, is they think people are sending, or you know, even in, in magazines or billboards or you know, this type of thing, they, they see secret messages that are just for them. Okay, this actually happened. There was a woman who believed that David Letterman was secretly sending her hints in code in his monologue. She believed this. She actually got arrested for going to his house and stalking him, okay? That's to read something wrong. Now, if I was to come home and I go, okay, here's a grocery list. Let's say my wife wrote out a grocery list and it's sitting on the counter. This is an excellent example. And I looked at it and I go, hmm, what do you think she means here by strawberry yogurt? What is she trying to hint at when she says asparagus? If I were to read it that way, then I may have mental illness because it's obviously intended to be read as a grocery list. What she means by asparagus is asparagus. It means we need to get some asparagus. She's not sending me a message through asparagus. So this is kind of 
the way that all millennialists read the Bible is they'll see something that says, and then there'll be a thousand years. And they go, well, it doesn't really mean a thousand years. What it really means is the blessedness that we are experiencing in Christ. Now, we should understand these things, not literally, but more symbolically. It's, symboli it's, it's symbolism that points to something else, okay? So the people arrive at these different views largely based on how they approach the Bible. Now, notice something. If they take more of a spiritualized perspective, which says certainly there's not a physical, Jesus is not going to come back and establish a physical kingdom on the earth, which is exactly what Greek philosophy would say, right? Greek philosophy would say the earth, the physical realm is bad. We need to escape the physical realm and become spirits. So when the Bible comes along and says, no, he's going to redeem creation. We're going to get bodies. The Greek philosophical world goes, that's impossible. It's impossible, right? So you can see how worldview affects the way people often interpret the Bible. And if we lean too much toward an overly spiritualized perspective, when asparagus doesn't mean asparagus, instead asparagus means she must really be mad at me, you know, why else would she put asparagus? Um, then we're reading the Bible wrong. And then post-millennialism, as I said, that's something that really came along much, much later and it's an effort to try to reconcile these two um, perspectives. For what it's worth, um, coming up here soon, when I have the time, when I clear out some of my projects, I'm gonna really push into this issue of post-millennialism um, because it is really sweeping the church in many ways. It's growing by leaps and bounds. Now, let me say something as a bit of a side note with regard to amillennialism because now we're getting into another sort of category or subset uh, of theological categories to help us understand the end times. And that is the difference between preterism and futurism. There's other categories that, that are often discussed such as idealism and different things, but I just wanna focus on preterism or futurism. Two ways of interpreting um, some of the more prophetic texts in the Bible, such as the book of Revelation, Daniel, Matthew 24, Jesus's Olivet Discourse, this type of thing. And that is to say preterists, preterism just simply means history or in the past. Preterists basically say that most of these prophecies were all fulfilled back in the first century. Not all of them. There's some that still remain, um, but they would say, for example, the Antichrist, that all happened in the first century. The mark of the beast, that was something that already happened. The great tribulation, that has already happened. We don't need to worry about those things anymore. Those are all things of the past. Then there are, the futurists would say, no, the anti, like the book of Revelation, that's all in our future. That's not past, that's not a history book. It's primarily future. The antichrist, the mark of the beast, the great tribulation, those are all future. This school of interpretation is called futurism. Okay, now among amillennialists, among amillennialists today, you have some who are preterists and some who are futurists. Those who are futurists, I refer to as orthodox amillennialists. The reason I say that is because throughout much of church history, throughout a good part of church history, most Christians would have been orthodox amillennialists. Okay, they, they believe in the millennium, which is to say once Jesus I'm sorry, they believe that once Jesus returns, we just enter the eternal state. We're in the spiritual millennium now. We still have to face the Antichrist, the Great Tribulation, but at the end of that, Jesus returns, that we enter the eternal state. This has been the majority position throughout most of church history, not all of church history, but through much of it. Now, as far as post-millennialists, they're pretty much all going to be preterists. They're all going to say all of the hard stuff is past. We're now just moving on to victory, victory, victory. Okay. Now, among the premillennialists, pretty much all premillennialists are futurists. They believe that at the end of the age, we're going to face the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the great tribulation. Jesus returns and defeats them and then establishes his kingdom. Okay. So that's a good sort of brief overview of the hermeneutic or the approach to interpreting scripture that accompanies each of these three positions. So here is a chart of premillennialism. Premillennialism, okay, ready, is simply the Christian term that we use to describe Jewish apocalyptic, Jewish apocalypticism. So we looked at the previous chart, which says that we're in this age, 
and then you have the day of the Lord and the age to come. This is the same chart. The difference is, is that we believe that Yahweh God Almighty is actually coming back in the form of Messiah, that Jesus himself is God incarnate in the flesh, and that the one who's coming back, yes, he's Yahweh, but yes, he's also Jesus of Nazareth. And it's through Jesus of Nazareth, through the seed and the king of Israel, that he will establish his kingdom on the earth. So Jesus came the first time, he ascended to heaven, as we've got here in the chart. He's coming back in blazing fire at the day of the Lord to establish the age to come. Premillennialism is simply the Jewish apocalyptic framework. Premillennialism is simply the Christian interpretation of the entire universe as it would have been held by a first century Jew, by Jesus or by the apostles. Okay, so that's pre-millennialism. Now here is the part that I really wanna emphasize. The earliest of the early church fathers after the apostles, for the first really 300 plus years of the church, overwhelmingly were premillennialists. This is very important. They believed in a literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus on the earth before the eternal state. So some of the names were Papias, Justin Martyr, Barnabas or Pseudo-Barnabas, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Tertullian, Lactantius, Victorinus, etc. Okay, and really anyone in the first couple hundred years of the church, the, the majority position, not all of them, but the majority position would have been pre-millennialism. And I find this really fascinating. I want to look at just a few quotes from some of these guys, just so that we can see that they were quite clear. Um, it's not to say that there was not still a lot of confusion, but it is fascinating to see how clear they were on this issue and to see their reasons, their basis for holding this view. So Papias, um, Eusebius, the church historian, says that Papias was the bishop of Herap Herapolis, okay, so in basically Turkey, around the time of uh, Ignatius of Antioch. So he was basically a bishop in Turkey. Turkey is where the seven churches of Revelation were. And it was during the time period, the transition from the first century into the second century. So just, you know, let's say 30 years or so after the book of Revelation was written, the transition into the second century. Now Irenaeus, okay, who was Polycarp's disciple, Polycarp is another early church writer, he referred to Papias as an ancient man who was a hearer of John and a companion of Polycarp. So according to Irenaeus, okay, a very, very important early church theologian, Papias was actually someone who heard the apostle John himself teach on these things. Okay, so a very important voice. Now, the problem is we don't have any of the writings of Papias in complete form. Rather, we have fragments and quotes of them in Eusebius and some other places. Uh, Irenaeus actually quotes him quite a bit. So we don't have the original manuscripts. We just have quotations of him, but we can still look and see that this man who actually heard directly from the Apostle John was clearly a premillennialist. Again, so you can see he wrote around that time period, 8095 to 8110. I'm gonna quote Papias here. Now, look at the detail, look at the thought that he put into this. He says, I shall not hesitate. This is, this is sort of his basis. In the early years of the church, orthodoxy or truth was a matter of, we heard it directly from the apostles. They heard it from Jesus. So you can see his emphasis on the importance of early oral tradition within the church. Papias says, I shall not hesitate also to put in ordered form for you along with the interpretations, everything that I learned. Look, he says, I learned it carefully in the past from the elders, in other words, the apostles, and I noted it down carefully for the truth of which I vouch. He says, for unlike most people, I take no pleasure in those who told many different stories. He goes, I wasn't following after all these people that are telling all these stories. He goes, I only paid attention to those who taught the truth. Nor did I take pleasure, nor did I uh, really pay any attention to those who reported their memory of someone else's commandments, but only those who reported the memory of the commandments given by the Lord to the faith and proceeding from the truth itself. And if by chance anyone who had been in attendance of the elders, anyone who happened to actually have heard the apostles themselves, I made inquiries about the words of the elders. I would always ask, what did you hear? 
what Andrew or Peter had said or Philip or Thomas or James or John or Matthew or any of the Lord's disciples. He calls them the elders. Or whatever, Aristion or John the Elder, there's John the Apostle, the Lord's disciples were saying, for I did not think that information from the books would profit me as much as information from a living, surviving voice. So here was a guy, he was alive, overlapping with the lives of the apostles. And he goes, I tried to pay special attention to what the apostles themselves who were with Jesus had to say. And I was very careful in how I recorded this. So here's a statement that he makes. This is in Second Papias Fragments that's in Eusebius's um, History of the Church. He says, there will be a millennium, there will be a thousand year millennium, after the resurrection of the dead, when the kingdom of Christ will be set up in material form on the earth. Notice he emphasizes in material form on the earth. God's coming down and he's going to dwell and live on the earth. He's going to have a body. We're going to have bodies. So here is one of the most important. I'm not saying that, you know, any all of these witnesses are perfect. Of course, they're not. But you can see the attention that he paid to the details, the words of the apostles, and he was clearly a student of John the Apostle, and he was a pre-millennialist. Then we have Justin Martyr. Um, he lived rough, he was born roughly around the turn of the first century, and he lived in the range until about AD 165. He says this with regard to the millennium. This is in his dialogue with Trypho the Jew. He says, but I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points, in other words, Orthodox Christians, he says, we are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem. He goes, so all of us who are Orthodox Christians, we're not the Gnostics, we're not fringe, we're not some weird sect. We are assured that there will be a 1,000 year reign uh, in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, enlarged, and then he goes, I love this, as Ezekiel, Isaiah, and others declare. I love the phrase when Peter says, as was spoken of by all the prophets. In other words, this is what the Bible teaches. This is what the Lord has been saying repeatedly throughout all of the prophets, throughout all of the Bible. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, doesn't matter. They all speak of Christ on the earth, a material reign. And he says, and further, there was a certain man of us, with us, whose name was John, one of the apostles of Christ, who prophesied by a revelation that was made to him, and those who believed in our Christ would dwell a thousand years in Jerusalem. So here he's saying that John the apostle wrote the book of Revelation, and in that revelation he was given a very clear understanding that Christ would dwell a thousand years in Jerusalem, and that thereafter the general and in short, the eternal resurrection and judgment of all men would likewise take place. I believe exactly what uh, Justin Martyr here has to say. Then we have Pseudo-Barnabas. I say Pseudo-Barnabas because this was not the real biblical Barnabas. It was someone who was pretending to be Barnabas. Thus, we call him Pseudo-Barnabas. This was very common um, back in this period. And this was written, again, somewhere between AD 120 and 150. So early, uh, the or first half of the second century. He says, in 6,000 years, all things will be finished. So this was a very common view in the early church that history is 6,000 years old, that the world is 6,000 years old, and at the end of the 6,000 years, we enter into the Sabbath, the 1,000 year, the, the 7,000th year of creation, and that that's the millennium. That was the idea. He says, then shall he truly rest on the seventh day. So he says 6,000 years, and then the final 1,000 years is referred to as the seventh day. Again, very common. So you got three early church writers now, clearly affirming a millennium. Um, then we have Tertullian. Tertullian wrote probably a little bit after Irenaeus, but they were alive during the same general time period. Uh, Tertullian wrote into the early part of the third century, the 200s. He says, but we do confess that a kingdom is promised to us upon the earth. There it is, the millennium, a physical kingdom on the earth. Although before heaven and in another state of existence, inasmuch as it will be after the resurrection for a thousand years in the divinely built city of Jerusalem. It will be divinely built on the earth for a thousand years. Tertullian, one of the greatest theologians of the early church. And then one final statement. 
uh, from Lactantius. He actually uh, wrote and lived into the early part of the fourth century. So now you're talking a solid 300 years after Jesus. He says, but when the thousand years shall be completed, the world shall be renewed by God. There it is, the renewal of all things, the redemption of the cosmos, of the entire earth. He says, and the heavens shall be folded together and the earth shall be changed. After the 1,000 year period, he says, heaven and earth will essentially become one and changed. So you've got him making reference to the thousand year period. So now I've got a little chart here. Um, I've got the first century all the way up to the seventh century. And you can see that the dominant view concerning the, the millennium, the dominant eschatology of the early church going into the fourth century, so the first 300 years of the church was pre-millennialism. They simply believe what the Bible taught. They held to the dominant view of the Jews, not only in the first century, but before that. Those who studied the scriptures, those who were given the oracles, the promises, they knew the promises, they knew the Old Testament, they knew the Bible, and that led them to believe and expect and hope for a literal millennium on the earth, a literal kingdom when God would come down from heaven to the earth and establish his kingdom or the age to come. That was the dominant view. Now, the early church, as we all know, you have the Jerusalem dispersion, the persecution, and the largely Jewish leadership of the church that was headquartered in Jerusalem was then dispersed all over the place. And then you have the ingathering of the Gentiles. The Gentiles come flooding in. Now, the Gentiles would have largely been discipled or taught or raised more on a biblical worldview or more of a Greek worldview. The Gentiles would have largely been discipled and taught based on a Greek Platonic worldview. So they would have held to more of a, a Greek pagan worldview. But then many of them were becoming Christians, even reaching the place of leadership in the church, right? So now you have these Christians that still have some of their old views coming in, trying to understand the Bible. And of course, Christians are infamously New Testament centric. There's nothing wrong with studying the New Testament, but we should understand and know the Old Testament first, right? Okay, so the early church quickly became Gentile, deeply affected by Gnosticism or the Greek pagan philosophical worldview. They began embracing not only bringing in this idea, well, how can God come and dwell on the earth and have a kingdom on the earth because the earth is bad. No, the goal is to become spirit. The goal is to go to heaven forever. So not only did they start spiritualizing things, but they also embraced replacement theology. Replacement theology is essentially the idea that the church has replaced the Jews. The idea that the Jews as a people have been forever rejected. They've been dissolved. They've been dispersed among the nations. And we have now inherited uh, the church has now inherited the blessings of being the people of God. And if the Jews want to come join us, they can. But as a people, they no longer are the people of God. They're just like anyone else, right? So that is the idea. So you had two, um, two things that sort of came in as a result of Gentiles uh, coming into the church. One was the idea that a literal millennium on the earth, that, 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 that can't be. Like the earth is bad. No, we need to get away from the earth. And the idea that the Jews were no longer the people of God. Replacement theology or supersessionism. So those are the two things that crept into the church very early on. And for what it's worth, replacement theology, supersessionism, it is for all intents and purposes, the mother heresy. It is from that heresy, it's from that era that so many other errors crept into the early church. That really is the primary foundation for where the church got off. So, the um, many began teaching that Israel was rejected, whereas the church is now the new recipient of God's favor and blessings. So furly, further, the early church fathers that were, that were taught, they were from Alexandria. They really began to um, exert a tremendous amount of influence. Now, I've got a little map here of the ancient world. And just to look at the Mediterranean, over there on the right, you've got Israel, you can see Capernaum, Caesarea, and so forth. You've got Israel. And then the seven churches of Revelation, as well as Antioch, um, up there in modern-day Turkey. And then over there, you've got Greece to the left, right? The Greek islands and so forth. Well, 
down there in, you got Alexandria at the very bottom of the map, Alexandria, Egypt. When the Greeks left Greece and they conquered much of the Middle East, Alexandria, just across the ocean there, it became the hotbed of Greek education. That's where the great library of Alexandria was that burnt down. Can you imagine the documents that were there that were lost when that great library was burnt? But there in Alexandria, it was just an extension of Athens. It was an extension of Greece. And, and Rome, by the way, basically um, continued. It held up so much of the Greek philosophy. So the ancient world that was, that was invaded by Europe, by the Greeks, they brought their philosophy. They really thought their philosophy, or you could say their religion, was like the salvation of mankind. They brought it. They spread it wherever they went. Alexandria was like a, a missionary hub, if you will. And so people that were from Alexandria, they had been so thoroughly indoctrinated with the Greek philosophical worldview that when they became Christians, they were the ones that were the most allegorical. They were the ones that had the, the craziest, most spiritual interpretation of everything. And so some of the big names, of course, Clement of Alexandria and then Origen. Now listen, Origen was such an allegorist. He, was, he used such a spiritual metaphorical hermeneutic that he was actually branded a heretic by the church. A lot of people don't know that. They quote Origen like, he was an early church father. He was considered a heretic. And when you read some of his stuff, the guy had an incredibly brilliant mind, but he would be like, you know, again, going back to the, to the grocery list, asparagus. And he would write like four paragraphs. He would not just say asparagus means that my wife is mad at me. He would explain why. He'd be like, well, surely, because everyone knows that asparagus represents the lower, more base elements of mankind. You know, like, like these incredibly detailed, and you'd just be like, what? Like, what does that have to do with anything? And a spiritualized, sort of like, you know, you would look at a story, just a story of, you know, any story in the Bible, and he would always find the deeper meaning. You're always looking for the deeper, more spiritual meaning and the embedded um you know, sort of Easter eggs that are hidden. The Lord is hidden all of these secrets everywhere. And it's amazing the degree to which, quite frankly, when I listen to sometimes, particularly in the charismatic church today, not just, and I consider myself charismatic, when you listen to some of the teaching of some people today, I go, that's Gnosticism. That sounds way more like when I'm reading Origen or even some of the Gnostic um, heretical uh, early documents versus the Bible. Like it's amazing the degree to which some people today really embrace a, what I would argue is, is just basically modern day Gnosticism. It's a mixture of Christianity with Greek pagan philosophy. And then you have Cyril um, of Alexandria. And of course, Augustine was really um, the most influential, looming, towering, uh, theologian among all of them. But these were the guys, when you read their stuff, they were the one that led many in the church to leave behind the premillennialism, the Jewish perspective of the early church. They were the ones that said, oh, we can still be Christians, but we have to do so more, th more so through a, a Greek philosophical uh, perspective. So here's a chart, um, again, showing amillennialism. Jesus went up, okay, into heaven. And after he went up, we are in a spiritual millennium now. He's going to come back and then we will enter the eternal state. It's an extremely simplified chart. But again, by the time that we reach Augustine, Augustine, however you want to pronounce it, he really, as such an incredibly important towering figure, he really cemented the fact that from that point forward, the dominant view of the church would be amillennialism. And it was really, it was like, um, Augustine is like a Luther-like figure. Like you can almost go before Augustine, this is what much of the church believed. After Augustine, this was the, the, sort of the new perspective. He was again, an incredibly influential and incredibly intelligent individual. So this is amillennialism. Now I've got a chart where I've expanded church history. So first, again, as I said, for the first 300 years of the church, premillennialism or the Jewish apocalyptic framework, that was the dominant eschatology. After the Gentiles crept in and sort of kicked out a lot of the Jewish leadership or it was much less of a Jewish-led um, 
sect or movement, if you will, and all of the Greek philosophy begins creeping in. Some of the Alexandrian fathers really start exerting tremendous influence, and you've got a few hundred years of debates, and then you have Augustine from that point forward, right up until the Reformation. So you're talking 1,200 years or so, the, the dominant view of the church was amillennialism. Now, to be clear, as I said, it was futurist amillennialism. So they still believed in a coming Antichrist, tribulation, all those things. But after that, Jesus returns. We just enter the eternal state. There's not a literal physical kingdom here on the earth. No, 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 no. It's just the eternal state. And amillennialists would often be quite vague in terms of what that means. Um, and by the way, historically, it was more of the idea of someday we just go to heaven forever. Um, after Anthony Hakima, who was a theologian, writing back in like, let's say the 1980s, he really articulated, no, actually the age to come is very physical. It's very material. Many amillennialists um, up until modern times, such as N.T. Wright, um, now, although they're amillennialists, they do believe the age to come is much more material, much more physical. So really over just the past few uh, decades, uh, those that are amillennials, they've embraced a slightly more biblical worldview, but they'll just never go so far as to say there's going to be an actual restored kingdom of Israel, which is what Jesus taught, by the way. Acts verse one, Acts 1 verse 6 actually says the disciples, after listening to Jesus teach about the kingdom for 40 days, this is after his resurrection, they were like, okay, so when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And that is what the Bible teaches, that Jesus, as the son of David, will restore the throne of David. He will restore the kingdom of David. Okay, so during the Reformation, now we, we're moving all the way up to like the 1500s, okay? During the Reformation, the church begins returning to study the scriptures. And that, that, that side of things cannot be understated. It was getting back to the Bible that changed everything. And they were going, well, wait a minute, there's no millennium, but then there's all this stuff that the prophets say. And I would, I refer to it I refer to this period of the Reformation with regard to eschatology, specifically concerning what was the dominant view of the Reformers. Some started embracing post-millennialism, some started getting back into pre-millennialism. I refer to it as the age of confusion. And the reason I say that is because they were kind of all over the place. They were trying to figure it out. And it took them a few hundred years until they really began to start figuring it out. But as I said, there were a wide range of different ideas, but we did see during the Reformation for the first time, and really in the aftermath of the Reformation, we started seeing what's called post-millennialism. So here's a chart of post-millennialism. Again, Jesus rose, he ascended to heaven. The early church was birthed out of persecution, but we're presently ramping up. We're becoming more and more victorious. We're exerting more influence. Things are getting better and better, better. And eventually we are going to create a golden Christian age. We're going to establish the millennium on the earth that the earth will be, you know, all of the beautiful descriptions in the Bible concerning the coming kingdom. We will actually make that happen. We're gonna do the heavy lifting in partnership with Jesus. And at the end, we hand him the kingdom on a silver platter. And he says, thank you guys so much. I so deeply appreciate your obedience and all that you've done, and then we enter the eternal state. I'm being a little bit silly, but this is the general framework, okay? We start in persecution, we move on to victory. We should expect to conquer the earth through the gospel. And so here is a chart. Again, the church started out for the first 300 years, pre-mill, pre-millennial. Then it was dominated for the next thousand plus years by orthodox amillennialism. The Reformation came, I call it the Age of Confusion, in the 1830s. So here we are, about 200 years ago, you had a movement that sprouted up out of the UK, Ireland and England called the Plymouth Brethren Movement. The Plymouth Brethren Movement was a group, they were largely leaving the Anglican Church. You know, they were kind of elitists to a degree, but they were doing more like home uh, study fellowships, and they really mastered the art of doing conferences and gatherings and things like this. And it was John Nelson Darby. Um, John Nelson Darby. What did I say? John. John Nelson Darby, who was really one of the voices that emerged out of the Plymouth Brethren, that is most famous. And he developed a system of eschatology called dispensational premillennialism. So he was basically reclaiming 
the perspective of the early Christians of premillennialism, but he created his own very unique form. It was a very specific system of eschatology called dispensational premillennialism. I'm not going to tease out everything that that means. By the way, I have laid this out in a previous session called What is Dispensationalism and Why It Must Die? That's in the Rapture in the Endurance of the Saints series. And I'll probably teach on these things multiple times in different forthcoming sessions. But roughly half the church today, roughly half the church today holds to dispensational premillennialism. Dispensational premillennialism, I've got a chart here, holds that at the end of this age, which they call the church age, we will be raptured. We will go up to heaven to meet Jesus in the clouds. We will spend seven years in heaven during the tribulation and then we come back with him he establishes the millennium at the end of the thousand years we enter the eternal state so dispensationalism while there are a handful of differences between historical premillennialism which i hold to historical premillennialism while there are a handful of differences the primary difference is that dispensational premillennialism believes in the pre-tribulational rapture they believe that we will be raptured before the tribulation. And the reason they believe that is because they have this very, very strong, harsh, rigid distinction between the church and Israel. And they teach that in different dispensations, the Lord works with different peoples and the Lord will return to working with Israel. And he only works with one group at one time. The church has to be out of here. I know it's super complicated and technical, but that's really it. Strong distinction between the church in Israel and the pre-tribulational rapture based on their idea of different dispensations throughout church history and this type of thing. Look, there are so many things that I agree with, um, with our dispensational pre-tribulational brothers and sisters. However, I am not pre-trib. I don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, and I do believe that they should just shed the system of theology that was taught by John Nelson Darby and just basically get back to simple historical premillennialism. Dispensationalism has brought a lot of weird, um, strange teachings. And it's, it's amazing the degree to which this sort of false doctrine has dominated large segments of the church today. So here's the chart. Again, um, we started out as premillennialists. Now, dispensationalism is premillennialism. It's just a, it's a unique form of it. I am of the opinion, and I speak this with confidence, I believe that before the return of Jesus, the majority of the church will return to historical premillennialism. I believe they'll actually embrace the truth. Now, I'm not saying that the church's doctrine concerning the end times is going to be perfect. I don't know that there's anything in scripture that, that points to that, but I do believe that the Lord is going to restore understanding to the church in the last days. I do believe that it's a view and it's a perspective that's spreading because it's true and it's pure and it's clear. It's easy to understand. And, you know, Oakham's razor basically says the easiest explanation is usually the right one. Historical premillennialism is by far the best system that makes sense of the scriptures and that communicates a message of hope to the poor and the broken and the needy of the earth. So I'm going to end this right here. I wanted to do a basic survey overview. What's the difference between amillennialism, premillennialism, and postmillennialism? Um, what are the different ideas that, and the different historical developments that went into these ideas, and why historical premillennialism is the best choice? It's the best choice because one, it was the view of the earliest of the early church, those who actually were very careful to listen to the apostles. It's the best choice because it uses the best hermeneutic. It interprets the Bible through the lens of rational literalism, which is the most reasonable, common sense, normal way to interpret language, okay? Um, and finally, because it offers us, actually not finally, um, let me say this first, it's only within premillennialism um, that we can understand that all of God's promises are true. That when God says, I'm going to give you this land, he means I'm going to give you this land. When God says, I'm going to give you this land, he does not mean that you will enjoy spiritual blessings in Christ. You will experience spiritual blessings in Christ in the land. You know what I'm saying? The land does not represent something else. The land is the land. So it's the best um, hermeneutic. We believe that God means what he says. We believe that he is faithful. Okay. And finally, it offers the poor of the earth the best hope 
imaginable. I'll be honest with you, post-millennialism, just thinking about it, makes me exhausted. I can't save the world. The church can't save the world. Really, the church is a mess. The church is falling apart. The church is imploding with corruption, deception, immorality in so many, so many ways. And the gospel is, and it has always been, a message of hope for the poor. Someday my Savior is coming back, and in that day I'm going to get to see my Father again. I'm going to get to see my deceased loved ones in Christ again. I'm going to get to enjoy food. I'm going to get to enjoy all of the blessings, all of the wonderful things that God created, because in the beginnings he created the heavens and the earth. And he said it's good. And we get to enjoy it forever in the restored Eden, in the restored kingdom of David, the restored Jewish um, monarchy that Jesus will establish when he returns. That's something that every man, woman, and child can connect with in a very deep emotional way and say, that makes me excited. But just someday I'm going to go to heaven forever and be a ghost. We can't get excited about that because that's not what we were. We were not made to be ghosts. So premillennialism, to me, people go, why do you care so much about eschatology? Because to me, biblical hope matters. Because without it, I have nothing. Without it, none of us have anything. These watered down, distorted messages of hope are not enough. We need to proclaim the pure message of hope that the Bible proclaims. So amen and amen. I'm going to end it right here. Um, Next week, I want, I just, I want to, zero in a bit more on why premillennialism is reasonable, why it is the best position theologically, and why some of these other positions are just untenable, why they simply fail to responsibly interpret the text. So we're going to get into a little bit more theological issues, but hopefully um, hopefully this was uh, edifying and benefited you all. So amen and amen, guys. God bless you all. Thank you so much for sticking it out. Have a fantastic week. Be blessed and look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, Maranatha.